this morning. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. After a solemn season of Lent, I thought it might be nice to start with a story on the lighter side. If you've heard it before, you can laugh again. A renowned scientist is on a lecture circuit and traveling via chauffeur-driven limousine. Night after night, the man delivers the same talk about the groundbreaking theories that he's developed. So while on the road one day, the chauffeur says, Professor, I have heard you give that lecture so many times, I'll bet I could deliver it myself. So admittedly tired of all of these speaking engagements, the scientist replies, very well. The people where I'm going to go tonight don't know me. So before we get there, I'll put on your cap and uniform, you'll introduce me as the chauffeur, and you will deliver the lecture. So everything starts out according to plan. The chauffeur delivers the lecture flawlessly. But then the program winds up and a professor in the audience raises his hand and asks all sorts of difficult questions that involve mathematical formulas. The chauffeur stops and he listens and then he responds in the most authoritative tone he could muster. Sir, the solution to those problems is so simple I'm really surprised that you even asked me to give it to you. In fact, to prove to you how simple it is, I'm going to ask my chauffeur to come forward, and he's going to answer your questions. <laughs> Happy Easter. In one sense, I'll bet most of you could step forward and deliver the basic Easter lecture. That is to say, I bet you already knew the story of the empty tomb before you walked in. But what if somebody asked you a probing question? Like how it happened, or why it happened, or what difference does it make? What would you do then? Would you look around for a surprise expert to come to the podium? And if there weren't any, what would you say? Now if that notion strikes you with fear, Rest assured, you're in good company. It's clear that the first witnesses were similarly befuddled by the resurrection. In Matthew's version, the guards that are watching the tomb, they shake and they become like dead men. The women are filled with fear along with their joy. And before they can utter a word, Jesus appears to a bunch of very confused disciples. Matthew is the only gospel writer to write an earthquake into the script which is like a cosmic metaphor for the way the resurrection blew everyone away. John Buchanan, one of my favorite writers, who was the editor of the Christian Century for a lot of years, he concluded in an article I read, some ideas are bigger than our intellectual capacity to deal with them. Now as a preacher, that makes me sigh with relief. Turns out we're all chauffeurs delivering the lecture. The resurrection is greater than human understanding and deeper than earthly fact. Great! But meanwhile, I have a sermon to preach. So what can I say in order to, at the very least, lift the envelope of divine mystery? How can I help us to know that the resurrection is real and true and powerful and eternal all the while beyond comprehension? My friends, we might not be able to explain the resurrection, but we can believe it through the signs of life it reveals. Signs in the past signs all around us, and signs pointing to the future. First of all, it's clear that something happened. Think about the disciples. When Jesus died as a common criminal, they were nowhere to be seen. They figured that his movement was over, and being near him would only render them guilty by association. 
The disciples weren't expecting Jesus to be raised, even though he said he would. And we just read that they were afraid when they came upon him the first Easter. But we also know, within short order, the resurrection transformed them from being men scared of their own shadow into being people on fire for the Lord. Did you hear Peter in the reading that John read? The disciples become witnesses to the resurrection and they proclaim Jesus as all-embracing love and forgiveness and eternal life for all people. The power of God's life-giving spirit was unleashed in the world. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. The resurrection filled the ancient disciples with life and passion and life-giving power with faith so ardent why they were willing to risk their lives to proclaim it. Something happened. But along with the past, I believe the truth of the resurrection is here and now. Colossians that Bethany read states that we are raised with Christ and should seek the things that are above. In other words, our lives have eternal meaning. We are not random or expendable. We are worthy of salvation for our lives. Did you hear? They are hidden in Christ. And this sheds a whole different light on our existence because it means that our eternal life has already begun. We practice resurrection, as poet Wendell Berry writes, as we consider that our actions and our relationships have eternal significance. Practicing resurrection, it means embracing the reconciling love of God now seeing ourselves and all creation as created by God and beloved. A sense of wonder and personal agency goes with this attitude as we understand ourselves both as worthy to receive love as well as being God's instruments of healing and renewal in our relationships with others and even with our planet and everything that shares it with us. The Spirit of the risen Christ, it enlivens us, it guides us. Practicing resurrection opens our eyes to seeing and being signs of possibility and life all over the place. Like the woman I visited in the hospital this week who shed tears over her family's overwhelming love. It gives her the will to live. Like the email exchange I followed that in the span of 24 hours organized two weeks worth of meals for a homebound person. Like the scientist enduring heat and hostile conditions to test water and soil in efforts to restore the Everglades. Like the surgeon preparing for delicate surgery on a toddler whose very life depends upon the success of that operation. Like the teacher in a high-risk neighborhood who sees potential in her young students and is tireless in her efforts to keep them on the right path. Resurrection can happen. Resurrection is happening now. One of my favorite poets is a professor at Yale Divinity School. His name is Christian Wyman. And he writes, Christ is not alive now because he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. He rose from the dead 2,000 years ago because he is alive right now. He's alive when we practice resurrection. Yet to me, perhaps most wondrous is the way the resurrection gives life to our future. A scene from the 1994 classic movie, A Shawshank Redemption, came to my mind to explain what I mean. The setting is the Shawshank prison in the 1940s. The characters include a banker named Andy, played by Tim Robbins, wrongly convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment, along with a longtime convict 
named Red, played by Morgan Freeman. There's this powerful scene when Andy has just finished a week in solitary confinement. He returns to the mess hall to eat with Red and a group of inmates. And he sets down his tray. One of the prisoners says, two weeks in the hole? Was it worth it? To which a character named Ben says, easiest time I ever did had Mr. Mozart to keep me company. Another inmate thinks he's figured the comment out. So they let you tote that record player? Ben shakes his head. Nah, it's in here. That's the beauty of music. Can't get that from you. The group of prisoners look puzzled. Andy remarks, haven't you ever felt that way about something? You need it in here so you don't forget. There's something inside they can't get to, can't touch. It's yours. Hope. The group looks at him incredulously. And Red takes a swipe at Andy's comment. Hope is a dangerous thing. Drive a man insane. Got no use here in the inside of these walls for that. But Andy is not deterred. He says, hope. Hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things. Because hope never dies. Sisters and brothers, this, I believe, is the most vivid sign of the resurrection. It transforms us into people of hope. Hope that never dies. After all, I bet we all know imprisonment of one type or another, whether it's choices we've made, regrets we harbor, challenging relationships, fragile life circumstances, economic stresses, personal demons, the relentless assault of aging, the universal predicament of missing the mark of who we're intended to be. It's called sin. Yet Easter hope proclaims that we have a future and it can be different because Christ can make all things new. Situations may be difficult. Decisions may be tough. There might be hardship. There might be suffering. There might be loss. But because the resurrection is real, we can be confident that whatever limits us or breaks us or challenges us, it's not the end. There is more beyond what we can see and more than we now know. There's a life ahead. Not only on earth when we bring light and life to dark spaces, but beyond death and into eternity. So what could we say about the resurrection? That it's real. It reveals life in the past, in the present, in the future, and there are signs of healing and hope and salvation all over the place. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.